This is Standard Office Procedures, the podcast that helps professionals live and grow through culture, communication, and candor. Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of the Standard Office Procedures podcast. I am your host, Grace, and here with me as always in the studio is Shannon. Say hi, Shannon. Hi, Shannon. Hi, Shannon. (laughs) And today we're talking about a fun, fun topic, micromanaging. Oh, fun. Oh, fun. Specifically, how to not do it. We're going to talk a little bit at the beginning about why you should not do it, the effects that can have on your employees, and then we're going to talk about how to avoid micromanaging because it's the worst. Don't do it. (laughs) Truly. I have been micromanaged. I have micromanaged. I've seen it from both sides of the coin, and I've seen that it's just it's just no bueno. It's so ineffective. It's it's just like the when you try to hold on to something so tight. What's the analogy with the sand or something when you hold on like so tight? I don't know, but I like it. I'm holding on tight too. Also, what is it? There's some analogy. Anyway, it's just that you can't hold on that tight. Like you're gonna kill it. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> I really crushed it. That was a good metaphor. <laughs> that was a good metaphor. It's you're welcome. Look like at Thursday today. I'm in a weird mood. So I'm glad that you started off that way. So let's talk about what it looks like when you micromanage your employees. Like what what are the effects that micromanaging has on your team? So there's some pretty straightforward ones, pretty obvious ones are increased stress, right? It's really stressful when you have a boss who's like, do your job, but also I'm going to tell you exactly how to do it. If you do it not any other way, like you fail, right? But then also not give you the resources that you need to actually do it in the time with the requirements that I've given you. Which usually is I'm not happens. saying I'm speaking from personal experience <laughs> from a job that I quit after two months, but Ooh, I'm yes. just saying. That can happen. Also, it has enough. It, and what? Also, it inver- What? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, also, it adversely impacts morale, right? It can really like yeah. send morale into a nosedive when you feel like you're not able to make decisions autonomously and do your own work to your own satisfaction and basically feel like an like an independent work person. I mean, because work person. <laughs> work. <laughs> work. I mean, I think we all like want to do a good job. I mean, yeah, if you're not generally. a crazy person, you want to do a good job and right. you want to make your boss happy, even if it's just to keep them off your back. Sure. And when somebody is micromanaging you, they don't ever tend to let up on the micromanaging mm-hmm. and it feels like you can't ever do anything right because they don't trust you to do anything yes. and that just causes morale to tank. Yes. And so you said they don't trust you. And so there's another um, impact of micromanaging is low confidence, lack yes. of confidence. And oftentimes when you feel like you're not trusted to do mm-hmm. your job well, it makes you wonder why am I not being entrusted yes. with this job? Am I not good at my job? Am yeah. I not good enough? Am I, did I not think I'm capable? And that over time can have a really adverse impact on your confidence. Um, this also can lead to decreased productivity. So in micromanaging, you're actually doing the opposite of what you're trying to do. Like usually people micromanage just because they want something done quicker mm-hmm. or to their standards mm-hmm. or, you know, for all kinds of reasons. Um, but oftentimes micromanaging leads to decreased productivity. So you're actually hurting yourself and making things take longer, probably end up worse, you know, all a myriad of things that aren't ideal. Yeah, I think people who tend to micromanage, not all of them, but I would say a lot of them, it it comes from a place of fear, right? Like, well, if I just let them do it, like, what if they do it wrong? Mm -hmm. What if it's bad? Whatever. But if I just control every little piece of it, then it'll be great. Well, first of all, why did you hire somebody to do it anyway if you were just going to micromanage every piece of it? You have to learn to trust your employees because when when you don't, they're just like, they're never going to go above and beyond. Mm-hmm. They're going to do exactly what you want them to do. And it makes it very difficult for them to do anything else. And that not only is that going to hurt productivity, it's going to hurt potential productivity, yeah. which, you know, we want people to do more, do better, do more, do better. And micromanagers sometimes don't understand why they're not getting those results. And it's because they're holding on so tightly. There's no room for anybody to do anything else. Well, and so what you kind of hit upon there was that um, this other piece, this other impact piece, which is low innovation. Right? Yes. So it can really inhib- inhibit innovation and creativity because people aren't going to want to step outside their like their thinking box and do something new and exciting when they know that their boss is just going to put the kibosh on it anyway yeah. and say, what are you doing over there? I wanted you to do it this way. Like mm-hmm. I told you, there's no room for innovation here. So why are you going to try new things and try to innovate and try to be creative and try to think of like new, better ways to do things when you're being told, nope, this is the only way to do it. I'm micromanaging you, right? I think when you are a micromanager, you are asking for people to be robots. Yes. You are not asking for people to be people and thinkers and creatives exactly. and innovators. It's you just want two automatons. opposite things. Yeah. yeah. You are going to be like your keyboard monkeys to like, you know, do the thing without mm-hmm. any thought. And that is, you can see where that would be incredibly unfulfilling Um, which the last kind of the last piece of this that we have on our blog post is that it leads to higher turnover. So when you have people who, I mean, we've all heard the adage where it's people don't quit jobs, they quit bosses. Mm -hmm. And I've certainly had this experience. I know you have Shannon where it's like, look, I loved what the work that I was doing, but you will not like get off my back basically. Mm -hmm. And I can't do anything right. It feels like, because if I'm not doing it your way, then it's wrong automatically. Even if there's the idea of equifinality, which is like multiple things can lead to the same outcome. 
Fancy like word, equifinality. Equifinality, I love that like that concept. Ooh. But yeah, there are multiple ways to arrive at the same conclusion. And as a manager, your job is to, in a lot of ways, kind of step back and facilitate that and let people figure out those different ways to arrive to the same conclusion. Yeah. You give them a goal and you say, hit this goal, and you leave it up to them to figure out how to hit it. Because theoretically, the reason you hired them is because they're capable. And so if you treat your employees like they're incapable by micromanaging them, they're just going to leave right. and find somewhere else where they feel fulfilled. Because especially now in the job force, like fulfillment is increasingly important yes. to workers. And People know now that they can demand that. Yes. I know that I can demand ful like fulfillment and job respect and, yep, and job things. satisfaction and a good workplace culture. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm not getting that, why would I stay when I know I can go get paid more and get that somewhere else? Exactly. Right. I don't mean me in particular. I'm just no, saying like in general. Yeah. yeah. So I think this is kind of in the same family. We've talked before about speeding mm -hmm. and rushing to get somewhere. And we've talked before about how like you can rush, 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 rush and be impatient as a driver, but you're not going to get there any faster. It's like a fraction of a second faster. It drives me crazy. It's the same thing. Like you're going to arrive at the same conclusion anyway. Right. Just let people do their jobs without making them miserable. Yeah, exactly. So let's talk a little bit about how to manage without micromanaging. Full disclosure, guys, my allergies are really bad today. So I feel like I might sniff a little bit, <laughs> which is a really gross sound. So if you hear it, I'm sorry. But let's talk about how to mi manage without micromanaging. We already touched on this a little bit. But um, one really important thing that you could do to make sure that you're not micromanaging is to give goals, mm. to give clear goals, not methods necessarily. It's not this is how we're going to do it to achieve this goal. You can say, this is how I've done it in the past that worked for me, mm -hmm. but this is the goal that I want you to hit. And then you kind of pull back, right? Yeah. You kind of take your hands off the wheel and say, okay, you're driving now. You know the point that you're trying to get to. You know the destination. If you know a different route, that's up to you, Yeah, right? It's, it's really tough, especially I think for new managers or people with new people on their team to trust that they're going to get the thing done. Mm -hmm. So you give them a goal. You give them some parameters and you give them a deadline and then what they do with it is up to them. This yep. is where it's really valuable to have like one on ones with your people on your team, you know, manager to subordinate and discuss projects as they're working on them. But I think I have done this in the past where I'm like, here's what I want you to do and here's how I want you to do it. And mm -hmm. they'll do it exactly the way I wanted them to do it. But like that's not they're not learning anything from that. And so letting go of the reins a little bit and be like, here's what I want. Here's what I want it by. Mm -hmm. Let me know if you need anything like yeah. that is training them to not need you to micromanage them right yeah. and so and if they make mistakes which they might and they probably they will, will yeah then like that's a learning opportunity for them to work on next time and improve but like also think about how much time you're freeing up for yourself by not telling them every step they need to do and making sure they're doing it like what's the point if they're going to get there anyway yeah and theoretically that's why you have people working underneath you right is so that you have more time yeah. to do other things that aren't this like in the weeds work yeah um and i think what you said there was really important Shannon, where you said Having one-on-ones, you mentioned this, um, you know, being able to be open to communication. So when you give somebody a goal and not a method, you are saying, I want you to do this. And then you're not like disappearing. Right. You know, you're still there. You're still around. You're still accessible. So right. if they have questions or they get stuck or they have uncertainties or whatever it is, like they can still reach you and say, hey, boss, I need some guidance. And that really is your job as the boss. Yeah. And if they solicit it, you can say, here's how I've done it in the past or here's how I would do it. What do you think about this? How would you do it? We're reading a book right now at work called Humble Inquiry, which um, is a really good book. It's by Edgar Schein. And it's about like it, the title really says it all. It's it's having a humility and a curiosity when you're approaching problems. Yeah. And so, you know, as a manager, your role is to very much embody this idea of humble inquiry where you're saying, OK, this isn't working for you. What have you tried? Right. Have you thought about this? Like how how you know how about this option or what what options do you think would work here is honestly a better question, mm -hmm. which is empowering them to solve the problem. So I think remembering that you need to be around for communication but you don't need to be like standing behind them, breathing down their neck. Right. And I think a lot of times we want to tell people how to do things because we're like, well, I've done it this way, this way and this right. way. And none of those worked. So it's not going to work for you. And so I just don't want you to waste your time doing that. And I think there has to be kind of a you have to walk the line there. Like, mm -hmm. it's good to share a few things. Sure. It's also really helpful to let people learn that on their own. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, how detrimental would it be if they did something and it was like, well, we can't do it that way. Right. Because of this or like, hey, this didn't work. Can you tell me why? We learn a lot better by doing yes. than we do by somebody Hearing. just telling us yep. or reading it. And so sometimes you got to let, you know, let go a little and let people figure that out on their own or come to the conclusion that mm, I it maybe could have been better if I did it this way. But why did that happen? Right. Then you can maybe talk them through or let them figure it out and they're going to learn so much more from it and be better for it. I feel like you've done that with me a million times when you were my manager. You were like, I'm just going to let Grace figure this one out. And that's really good for me because I do not learn. If you tell me one thing. 
I don't really like I hear it. Sure. But I learn way better from failing. Absolutely. And then I'm like, okay, no, I know this doesn't work now. Like Absolutely. I'm going to try this other thing. And I feel like you are very good about kind of like gently nudging me into the right sure. direction without actually like pushing me into that direction, sure. which is a, a talent. And I think, you know, it, it's hard to give and to receive feedback when things were not done quite right or they could have mm-hmm. been better. But I think it's really important to go through that experience and to learn how to give that kind of feedback in a constructive way mm-hmm. instead of just being like, well, that was wrong. Gosh, yeah, exactly. Why even bother? That's you know, it. let me show you exactly yeah. how to do it. it because it helps them think through problems. Say, for instance, um, if it's a graphic design project and it's like, OK, I want you to run with this and do it, then maybe, you know, they'll run into an issue when they're trying to upload their files to the printer. And it's like, well... That's because you need to set them up like this mm-hmm. and then they have to go and fix it mm-hmm. and then set it up. Right. But they're not going to make that mistake again. Yep. And I think we just kind of assume, well, they're just going to do it again, do it again, do it again. But like most people have won't. Most people will team. learn. Yeah. And if they don't, that's a performance issue. That's a separate conversation. It's not right. a performance issue for people to make mistakes and learn from them. It's a performance issue to make the same mistakes over and over yeah, again. Exactly. And I think that's really important for managers, especially new managers to remember. I think that's true. And we'll talk a little bit more about like the importance of failure in a moment. But um, another way to manage without micromanaging is to maintain some distance from your team mm-hmm. and like physical, literal distance. Now, this is kind of a luxury that not all companies have. Um, we're a good example of that where like we all sit pretty close together. Yeah. We don't have traditional offices in some of our office spaces. We're all just kind of in a clump. Mm-hmm. Um, so Shannon's department, for example, Shannon sits right there and the rest of our department is right around you. I don't think that's detrimental for your team, but I can see where it it would be. Like if you hear people collaborating and you butt in and you're like, oh, actually. So I think if you can't maintain a physical distance, which the benefits of that are clear, if you can maintain a physical distance, if you have a door, if you have an office, then you kind of step back, then you won't be as tempted to kind of Mm -hmm. meddle, for lack of a better word. Um, But if you find that you are in the same physical space, you'll have to be kind of conscious and aware of yourself. Like if you hear people discussing something and maybe it's not the way that you would do it, you have to kind of check yourself and be like, are they doing it wrong? Or are they doing it differently? Yeah. And even if they are doing it wrong, like Shannon was saying, is this such a big deal that I can't let them just fail a little bit and learn? Yeah. Which is a good opportunity. I, this is really hard for me when I'll hear maybe people on my team discussing something and I'm like, oh, I have something to add. It's not that it's wrong. It's just like, oh, right. I have something to add because I've always got something to add. And it's like, no, just like, just let, let it go. It like, out. what yeah. difference does it really make? Is it going to make that big of a difference? I think it's tough. We want to hear ourselves speak and share our knowledge and help yeah. everybody. But like, You know, sometimes that's not always necessary. I think there's also something like (laughs) there's a couple things here. One, if you know that you're the kind of person and maybe you have some flexibility to remove yourself from the situation. Mm -hmm. So like Owen used to be in the big office with all of us and he could not stand it because he would hear somebody speaking and he just couldn't help it. He had to get involved and he moved into a separate office. And I think that really helped him to put that physical distance in place. And I also like to allow it, you know, like if somebody wants to work from home or somebody's got their headphones on or whatever, like where I haven't really talked. I could sit right next to somebody and not really talk to them a whole lot in a few days about their work. Like and I have to be okay with that, Mm -hmm. you know, and just kind of trust that they're doing what they're doing. They'll let me know if they need me. And then that's why those like regular check ins are so valuable because they give you that opportunity to to be there. And then, you know, having other ways to get in touch like Slack or whatever it is, you know, just put the onus back on them or they're never going to learn, you know. What a beautiful segue to the next point, which is to communicate with your team. Oh, it was that was so well done. Talk, talk, talk. Um, so ask them what they need and you have to listen. Right. So when we say communicate with your team, when as somebody who's trying to not micromanage, that doesn't mean go talk to your team and tell them what to do all the time. Yeah. That's the opposite of what we think you should be doing. You should be asking them, hey, how's it going? Do you guys have all the resources you need? And then when they tell you when they give you feedback, listen very mm-hmm. well, like listen to what they're saying. And I think that's one of the best ways that you can manage yeah. is by being very open to their feedback. Right. I think it's important to to not take communication like don't take that first layer of communication and be like, okay, that's it. Done. You can say like, how's that project going? Good. Maybe ask some follow up questions like, well, how is specifically this part going? Where are you at with this? Mm -hmm. To what kind of deadlines do you have set for yourself here? Are you having any issues with this? You know, I know in the past that's been difficult for me. Are you finding what you need? You know be more specific with your Mm -hmm. questions and go deeper than like, hey, how's that going? Good. Because I think that's what leads people to become micromanagers is they'll say, how's it going? Good. And then they find out once it's done that that person, what it wasn't going well, they didn't even know it wasn't going well. And you're like, well, next time I'm going to make sure that doesn't happen. And the problem was it wasn't that you weren't communicating at all. It was that you weren't going deep enough and being specific enough and kind of giving people new avenues Mm -hmm. to, to, you know, 
ex- share with them like exactly where they are, exactly what they're dealing with, exactly what some of their issues might be. And so, you know, like going a little deeper, like it's just like when you interview somebody, you'd be like, tell me about this. Mm-hmm. And then they tell you and then you move on to the next question. But a good interview will we'll like, OK, well, so tell me more about yeah, the specific thing deeper. that you just mentioned. Dig a little deeper and you're going to get a lot more information that way. If you need some more inspiration on how to dig a little deeper, I recommend you watch the Disney classic film, uh, Princess and the Frog. There's a whole song that goes, dig a little deeper. Have you heard that song? No. Oh, my God. You left me hanging. I thought for sure you would start singing it. I did it. see Princess Tiana at Disney last she week. She's beautiful. She was I love her dress. It's a lily pad. Anyway, another way that you can manage without micromanaging is to accept the inevitability of failure. And so yes. we touched on this. Like, you are a manager. You have a team underneath you. They're doing stuff that maybe they haven't done before. Maybe they've done it before, but this is new. Whatever. Like, there's all kinds of ways that you're going to encounter failure. You have to let them fail, mm-hmm. not in catastrophic ways, right? I get it. There's a limit to everything. And like Shannon was saying before, there is a difference b- between failure and then just like not being. Owen confident. talks a lot about irreversibility there of you failures. Mm-hmm. You know, there are some things that are, we really can't let that happen. Yep. That's a major issue. Mm-hmm. There's other things that are like, that's a reversible issue. Yeah. Like that's we'd love it deal. if you didn't fail here, but you did. It's not the end of the world. And we're, we can learn from this. Yeah. And of course, you'll, it's important to remember that like, as long as you have somebody who's failing and then learning from it, mm-hmm. that is very different than somebody who just kind of makes mm-hmm. the same mistake over and over again, or doesn't seem to care about their job or whatever. But if you, if they're trying and the project doesn't go as well as you wanted it to, or you don't hit your goals or, you know, whatever it is. Those are opportunities for improvement. This yeah. isn't a, we failed, let's throw in the towel, or we failed, let's be upset with each other, or like cast blame. A really good way to reframe your thinking, which we talk about a lot at our office, and this is, we always kind of attribute this to Brandon Freeman, our director of sales, is to look at these failures as opportunities. Okay, so we've gotten a bunch of really valuable information here from this failure. Mm-hmm. What can we do next time to do better? And so if you have that idea as a manager, and you kind of pair that with that humble inquiry that we yeah. were talking about before, which is that humility and that curiosity, which is instead of saying you failed, whoever your team member is, you did this and you're you failed. Instead, you can be like, we dropped the ball here. How can we improve together? How can I help you improve? What opportunities do we have? Exactly. I think one thing that happens um, with managing, like you were saying, you know, we were talking about reversible problems, irreversible problems is it's kind of the boy who cried wolf with micromanagers is they are so intense on every little thing of every step of the process to get a project done where it makes it hard to know what is the most important thing. So everything is the most important thing. So yes. everything is stressful. Yeah. Whereas if there are pieces of the project that are super important that do need to be done a specific way, awesome. Mm-hmm. Hone in on those and let some other things go yeah. because those are going to be learning opportunities. And also they will know what to take more seriously, right? They know that, okay, this piece is really important. They're really focusing on this. Cool. And I'm still going to do my other stuff, but it's not, oh my gosh, it's all the most important thing. It's all, you know, it has to all be done this exact way because that's just not true. You have to have realistic priorities Mm -hmm. too. So another way that you can be a good manager without micromanaging is to facilitate and not dictate. So we've kind of said this before in different languages, but this is just a nice little pithy rhyming phrase for you to remember. But yeah, facilitate, don't dictate. So you are there to facilitate their success. You are there to facilitate your team's, Mm -hmm. you know, success and hitting these goals and finishing these projects. You are not there to dictate to them how it needs to be done, ideally, Mm -hmm. you know? And I think a lot of us, you know, sometimes it's true where it's like people who manage learn how to manage from micromanagers. So they they don't realize that there's another way to do it. They're like, oh, this is how it's done. This is the way I've always been managed and I'm doing just fine. But your job is not to sit down and be like, here's exactly how to do everything and here's how it should be done. There's no other alternative way. If you want to have like a thriving, successful, fulfilled team, you can facilitate their success. Yes. Give them a goal. Give them some guardrails, mm-hmm. some parameters, some parameters. Some parameters, yeah. Um, give them tools and resources mm-hmm. and be there as a tool and a resource for them. Yep. That's it. Yep. That's all you need to do. And then you got to step out of the way, yeah. really, primarily, which I know can be difficult for some people. Like, I don't want to downplay this and be like, this is easy. Just don't micromanage. Like, just stop doing it because it is difficult if you are, you know, I know for me, my experience was um, when Lizzie came in and Lizzie's amazing at her job and she's really, she's just way better than I ever was at certain things. And I knew that, but when she came in, she had to take over some tasks that I was doing and I had been doing them a certain way effectively for a very, like I say a very long time, a very long time relative to this company. And um, so when I handed the keys over to her, I was like, here's how everything is done. And then I had to like one day realize like, I I can't check up on her and be like, are you still doing it that way? Is it still going well the way that I had it laid out? And instead the question I should be asking is, are we still hitting our goals? Yes. That's it. That's enough of a question. Yep. And then if at the point where I was her manager, I should be like, 
oh, if we're not, how can I help you? Yes. Not, well, what are you doing? Can I go in there and look at your work well, and tell you, you where? Just done exactly. it the way I told like, you that to is do not it. Helpful. Yeah. And I know, I don't know if it ever got too bad there, but I know that mentally that was a shift that I had to sure. make from, it's hard when you go from doing the work to overseeing the work yes. to remove yourself from the process. And I had to very much remove myself from the process and say, look, this is her, she owns this now. So if she does it a different way, that's fine. This yeah, is the way I, I think, did it, but. I think it's totally valid to examine the success and the quality level of the final yes. product. Mm -hmm. But if you do that at every step of the way, like, yeah, man, you know, you never know what you're going to end up with. So like, look at the end product, you know, give this a try, let something go, mm -hmm. let somebody run with something and see what comes out at the end. And then maybe you have some specific feedback on the outcome mm -hmm. that maybe they'll tweak their process, but it's not really up to you to make that process anymore. It's their process. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Shannon. Well, that being said, we have a very, very good guest for you guys today. I'm actually really excited about this guest. Me I always too. am excited about our guest, but um, her name is Eileen and she is kind of one of my mentors. I feel like I have a couple. It's you and Shannon. Well, you are Shannon. Hello. You, Shannon, Eileen and Owen. And Eileen is, I want to call her an organizational psychologist. She's got a bunch of degrees um, and we work with her about how to work better as a team. Um, so she has, a lot of, she has a lot of insight on how to communicate better. And she's going to tell us all about how big organizations handle micromanaging. So I'm excited. Around. I know, me too. Thanks, Shannon. Bye. The Standard Office Procedures Podcast is presented by Blue Summit Supplies. We're an online office supply store that puts you at the forefront of our focus by offering new career-building resources every single week. Sign up for our newsletter and visit our blog at bluesummitsupplies.com for free downloads, tools, and tips to make your job easier and more fun. All right, guys. So we are back. And as promised, I have a very special guest for you today. Um, with me is Eileen Linneberry. Eileen, you're an executive coach and a practice leader. So you work for Vantage and you were, you were telling me just a moment ago exactly what being a practice leader means. First of all, how are you doing? And then can you tell me a little bit more about that? Thanks, Grace. I'm glad to be here with you today and doing very well. Thanks for asking. Uh, at Vantage, as a practice leader, that means that I run one of our lines of businesses, and in particular,